So uh, welcome to another exciting Food for Thought. Uh, I'm delighted to introduce uh, Elizabeth Arnaud and Marie Angelique uh, Laporte from Biovasity based in France. And they are members of the, uh, the ontology community of practice, uh, which is part of the big data platform. They are going to talk more about ontology, introduce it, and um, give us the purpose of ontology in knowledge modeling and explain further how ontologies are being used currently um, in the CJR for multi uh, multidisciplinary data. So without further ado, I'm going to welcome Marie Angelique and Elizabeth. Welcome. So hi everyone, so I'm Marie Angelique Laporte. So I'm like associate scientist at Biodiversity and, my, and I'm like an, an ontology engineer uh, there. So my role is mainly to work with ontology, to build them and then to apply them to, to, to data in order to make the data more uh, easy to use. So in my presentation today, and thank you for the invitation, by the way. So for the, in my presentation today, I'm going to introduce ontologies, how they can be used, and what they are and that, exactly. So first, why do we need ontologies? So for that, I'm going to take two uh, examples. So the first is uh, when I want to, I'm a scientist and I want to search for data. So there are several words that can be used to find data depending on my background. So if I'm a taxonomist, if I'm a scientist, or if I'm just like a normal citizen. So I can use different words depending on my background. And if I look for data, so here is an example of the Biodiversity Dataverse. And I, I'm going to use like several keywords to find the data. I can see that the results are different. So here, if I search for banana on the biodiversity dataverse, I can see that I have seven results. If I use the, the word musa, I can see that I have only three, six results. And finally, if, because I'm French, if I want to use like the banana, so the French word for banana here, I can see that I, I get only one result. So really, the problem here is really about semantics and is really about semantics and we can see that there is a an heterogeneity at the semantic level. So oh, yeah, I talked to her yeah, some time ago. So excuse me, can you mute yourself? Okay, thank you. So yeah, so there is a, a semantic problem here and so ontology are going to help for that and I'm going to show how later. So also like nowadays, the data are stored on different formats. So I can store my data in Excel file, in publication, PDFs, text file, CSV file, and even in databases. So the format are different, but also like the model, how the data are modeled in that, the, uh, those files is different. And also the data can be stored on different de device. So it can be stored on a laptop, on a computer, on a server, like even in a book or just being on a, on a USB key. So here again, I have a new problem that is like I'm facing like some sort of what we call in the domain of structural and syntactic heterogeneity. And here again, ontology can help to prevent that. And finally, particularly in, in our research as, as CGR, like the data need to go from one domain to another domain. So not, uh, I mean, the, do, uh, the data or even the word that are used to de describe the data and the concept behind them need to be understood not only in the given domain, but also to be understood when the data so from one domain to another domain. So if I'm a breeder, I will need data coming from the biologist and probably also coming from the farmer because like the variety is tested in the field. So I need to be sure that the data can flow smoothly between all those domains. And, and, and I mean, and, and the kind of domain we are dealing with is really broad. So it can go to the consumer, but also like to the sociologist and of course like to the information manager that has to, to, to present the data. So here we are facing a, a domain into, uh, heterogeneity and by having like ontologies, like uh, we can help like having those data flow from one domain to another domain. So here I'm going to dig in the, a kind of a second example and I'm going to present this data set, which is an agronomic data set that I downloaded, uh, that is from like the CIMIT uh, Dataverse. So this data set is coming from the Simlesa project that is a multi-site 
so multi-location, multi-year trial. And so this is a very good data set. So I didn't, uh, I, I don't show you like, but there's like metadata attached, all the variables that are in the data set are more or less described in a specific tab. But here I just want to, uh, to focus on, on the data tab. And first, I mean, what I can see is some columns are empty in that data set. So I'm a total outsider. I just downloaded the data. I'm kind of wondering, so why are those columns empty, exist if they are going to be empty? And also, if I start looking like at the, uh, at this column, which is a treatment that I applied to every plot, I mean, it, it's kind of, I can understand as, with the small background in, in agronomy, what is it about? So it's a maize, haricot, bill, and tercrop under conservation agriculture. And if I look at the second example, it's a sole haricot bill. So only haricot bill on that plot under like conservation practice. So if I look at data, I can understand more or less what it is. So if I continue in the data set, I still have those two columns that are empty. But here, instead of having like maize haricot beans, Intercrop, I just have like M underscore HB rotation CA. And if I look at the line below, I have like HBM rotation CA. So now I'm like wondering, are those treatments exactly the same? Are, the, are they the same for the, the one from before that we're just seeing maize haricot bean intercrop? So I understand that this data set has been uh, collecting all the data in that data set has been collecting from, from different people in different sites. But still, I mean, I'm a user, uh, if I'm a user of the data set, I'm still like a little bit, I'm, I'm wondering, are they different, are, are they the same? And, and I cannot know just that by reading like the, the data themselves. And if I continue, so still the empty columns and then new uh, way of expressing like the treatment part, uh, and more and more, uh, and now like the column are, are, are filled in, so it's it's say like it's an intercrop pigeon P, but why was it uh, empty before? I don't know. And and again, I mean, if I look at at this, I mean, I can see that no, now not there's no there's information about the crops so or maize, but now there's information about like the the tool that is used to plant the the, the maize. So it's very hard as a user of the data, not a primary user, but if I'm a secondary user, it would take me some time to, to, to really clean the data set and put it in a way where I can reuse the data that are there, even if the data are well described and I can understand what the data are about. So how can we prevent that? How ontology are going to use with that? So I, I took like this uh, agronomic data set example again, I just simplified it. So usually the data looks like, like a spreadsheet, but without context, it's really hard to say what it contains again. And usually a row will be a series of observations that, uh, that occurs at a, a given location, so at the plot level. But here, if I look at the, again, if I look at the, at the column headers, I mean, it's sometimes really hard to understand what those column headers are. And they can be, as you see with this treatment example, that they can be a mix, a mixture of things. So it's not easy to, to reuse the data in that context. And again, I mean, what are, what exactly the cell means? I mean, here I can see two different types of dates. Here I can see CA and CP. I mean, if I'm, I have a background in agronomy, I can understand. But if I'm uh, if I'm not, and I just want to understand what the data set about, it's very hard to to do. So how to make the column headers and the values clear for everyone? So this is really when where ontology helps. And instead of seeing the, the value as before, I'm going to see some sort of identifiers, identifiers that are clearly defined. I will come back on that a bit later. And, and so here I can see that I have several identifiers that make it more or less clear of what the data are about. So for the tillage practice, like the identifiers are, are coming for, from agro. This is the agronomy ontology that we develop in the context of the big data platform. And now CA and CP correspond to this identifier. And if I follow these links, those identifiers correspond to like a URL 
I can have more information about CA. I can have more information about CP. The same about the same structure, uh, the soil texture. Here, I'm, I've been using like the uh, uh, environment ontology, which is also like a big ontology in, uh, in, uh, available in, in the domain. And here, like the, the soil texture will be clearly defined. The same for like the crops, what they are. And here, the crop ontology um, uh, identifier to to exactly the, to know exactly what those values are about. So at here in this example, I only replace like the identifier for the value, but I could have done it for all the the headers. But then it would have make me <laughs> the example a little bit to explain because I mean I agree one of the downside of having identifiers in the table is here is more or less uh, human readable, but here is like mainly machine readable. But don't worry, there's tools that, uh, that are existing and that can go from those tables with identifier to go back to this, like where you can really see the value in the data set. So as a result of this little exercise, so going from that this spreadsheet to like this spreadsheet with ontology identifiers, I mean the the results will be easily can be easily shared and understood between the scientists as the ambiguity is really reduced. The data set can now be easily integrated uh, with existing uh, uh, resources, so it can be other data sets produced in different uh, contexts. The data set using those uh, uh, is now searchable in, in an efficient way. So now if I have like all my uh, my first example with like the dataverse, I mean, having the ontology uh, can help to to reduce like the semantic heterogeneity because each term is really well uh, defined and all the synonyms are pointing to the same concept. And finally, the data set can also uh, be of better quality because quality check can be applied on the data set. So this first part was more about the introduction and how uh, ontology can, can use and how uh, yeah they are used to annotate your data. But now I'm going to dig a little bit more about what is an ontology. So as we can see on this, um, this uh, picture, I mean, there is different types of semantic resources. So we have the ontologies here, but we have also like thesaurus and control vocabularies, taxonomies, data model, glossaries. And most of the time, all of that is referred as being ontologies. So the difference between those different semantic resources is about the semantics. So the way they are built, so they can be really weak. So in terms of semantic, or they can be really strong on term of semantic. But I mean, more or less, I mean, if I'm a normal user, I mean, I, I, I don't really care about this uh, weak semantic or strong semantic. They can all be referred as being ontologies. So if you read paper or if you read literature and you find like those terms, I mean, particularly like control vocabulary, thesaurus and ontologies, they can all be gathered under the broad term of ontology. So what is an ontology? So an ontology provides a shared vocabulary of a given domain. So all the terms of this domain are going to be defined. So they are going to have like a textual definition that describes the intended meaning of the term. And all the terms will be gathered in what we call concepts. And so this concept will have like a standard unique identifier that is like more or less a URL. So if you enter like the, this identifier in the web browser, you can go to a page and you can see all the information related to this concept. And usually, as I said before, it will be like the definition. It will be the preferred term. It will be all the synonyms. It can be like a bibliographic resources. So all the information is gathered under this uh, concept identifier. And finally, an ontology is like machine readable. So because of those kind of axioms that are the, ah, oh, yeah, I forgot to say that all the, the concept in the ontology are linked to uh, one, uh, two concepts can be linked in an ontology by a relationship that has meaning. And, and this relationship has also a definition. It has also like um, 
um, it has also like a URI, so a unique uh, identifier that if you enter like this unique identifier again, you can have the information about this relationship. So ontology are really like like a graph where all the pieces in your domain make sense because they are linked together. And so those links in the ontology are called an axiom and they are machine readable and they enable like a compute, uh, computable access uh, of the uh, as, uh, of the meaning of the class, and they allows you to really like run like some what we call reasoner in order to be sure that all the ontology still makes sense at the end. So I hope I've, I've been clear. Not sure, but yeah. But at the end, really, the ontology facilitates the data publication, access, and analysis of the data. So just, I'm sure that you heard about the FAIR principle, that is the findable and uh, accessible, interoperable and reusable uh, principle that are, uh, needs to be applied now for the data. Uh, and so really the ontologies are really this I part, like the interoperable part, and they are key for that. So if your data are findable, so if I can find your data set, on the web and it's easily accessible and I can have information about the license for that the reusable part. If like the, the data are not described using like vocabularies or ontologies, uh, then they are, they are not fair. So that's really uh, an important piece of the, the, this fair principle. Here I put an example coming from the, the crop ontology that just to show you what an ontology looks like. So. So as I'd say, it's like a sort of a graph. And here, I hope you can see my mouse. So you have like the different concepts in the ontology. So here, this uh, concept that is uh, the ND, uh, identifier 208, you can see that he has uh, this identifier, so this URI, unique resource identifier that uh, you can copy and paste in, in the border. You can see that the information that are attached, so he has a brief label that is green color. It has like a synonym that is in this case like an abbreviation, and then you can see a definition. You can see, you see that this green color is linked to a method of measurement. This is what we describe in the crop ontology, so like the breeders variables. And this method of measurement can also be, has also a definition, is has also a label, preferred label, and also like a source, so it's come from a, an external reference. And this method of measurement is linked to, to a scale that will give you like the color scale and explain exactly what in the data set if you find a two, that means that the grain color will be yellow. So this is basically like a, a, a graph view of the of the ontology, with like the unique identifiers, the link between like the main uh, concepts, and then all the information that are some sort of metadata attached to these uh, identifiers. So how can you know if there's like ontologies existing in your domain already or? Or, so I did a, a, a little uh, yeah search yesterday, and so I just listed some what I found. But I mean I'm not from the domain, so I don't know if it's like meaningful or not. But just to give you uh, some yeah some uh, somewhere to start. So you, I found like agrovoc and gaps that are co covering like the agricultural domain in 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 general. So probably they have terms and concepts existing for your domain. And I also find like FAO have this network fisheries ontology that are uh, covering like several aspects like water area, species, aquatic resources, land area, fisheries, commodity, vessel types and size, gear types, and then agrovoc again, and then this uh, vocabulary that is like uh, also something about fish. I found also several like fish morphotaxonomy uh, ontologies, like the fish ontology, like Uberon, that is more for all the the, the species uh, except for plants, and then the zebra fish ontology. But yeah, so some ontologies or vocabulary are, are, are existing for fish already. So I encourage you, if you are interested in joining like the ontology effort, to look at them uh, a little bit. 
And again, so those are a list of existing ontologies and where to find the ontologies on the web. So you can uh, use what we call like ontology registries. And so I listed three of them that are the most, uh, yeah, what I think are, are a good place to start. There is the ontology lookup service uh, developed by the EBI in the UK. Uh, there is AgroPortal, that is like an, uh, a, a registry, an ontology regi a registry for only ontology um, uh, agriculture that relates to agriculture in general. So, so yes, yeah, so OLS is more generic. You will find ontology about everything. But yeah, AgroPortal is targeting specifically like agriculture. And finally, Ontobi, like the interface of Ontobi is not Yes, it's not very good, but yeah, it's still uh, an, an, a registry that I think uh, uh, you can look uh, at. And of course, like AgroVoc, but AgroVoc is just AgroVoc and it's so big. So yeah, you can go directly on the FAO website for that. So uh, that's it. So that was just a, a really short introduction about ontologies, how, what they are, and how they can be applied to your data uh, in order to make the data more reusable by external uh, user, but also for you. I mean, in, in your experiment, I mean, you can, if you have the, a clean data set, like the analysis of the data can be much uh, quicker, so you can spend more data doing real research instead of doing cleaning of data. And also, I finish with this little uh, sketch um, that uh, that is like a good practice in the ontology world. So, if you can find an ontology that covers your domain, and 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 you have a new a new term or something that is missing to the ontology, so instead of trying to redo your own. Uh, standard because I mean maintaining an ontology is like uh, not easy. It is better to try to contribute to something that is uh, existing. So that's a good practice. That was like a, a funny little uh, the sketch. So so that's it. So thank you. And now uh, I mean I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and then Elizabeth is gonna explain how we apply like all those principles to like the uh, plant. Uh, domain as CGAR. So thank you. Okay, so um, good afternoon for you. It's early morning for us. Thank you to Jacqueline and Ku to for organizing the webinar. And uh, thank you, Marie, for the introduction. So I will take from there and I will just explain to you as an example, how do we use ontology and uh, ontology particularly for application for crops? So you, it may stimulate some thoughts for fish, of course. Um, so as you know, now the agriculture is becoming more and more digital. We are all involved in projects where we use either drones, uh, electronic field books, or um, high throughput uh, techniques for collecting data. We still use, of course, uh, classical Excel files. But there are many ways of collecting data, and uh, those data must go to database and data storage. Uh, and then from the data storage, they should be uh, available, as Marie said, for a secondary use uh, through meta-analysis or models for prediction. And from that uh, work, uh, data and information should be produced for informing the farmers. So the data will flow from one step to another one only if there is a good way of describing the value of your data. And then this is where the agreed terminology that clearly defines the meaning of the item carrying the information is important. So as Marie said, uh, this is very important for the ferrization of your data. It, ma it makes your data uh, able to go from one uh, step to another step of the data management cycle and be reused and be also integrated to other types of data sets for the purpose of analysis. So as you may know, at least in the world of the crop research, there are many, many applications being developed only within CGIR. So I made a list about the, the applications and tools developed at each step of the data management. Uh, 
and it's not an exhaustive list. So really, um, uh, there is a need to uh, propose um, a way of making those data clearly uh, described uh, and be able to move from one type of devices to the other one. So what makes the ground, uh, common ground to all those systems are the fact that they use the same data types and the same uh, variables description. That's very important. And of course, when you go at the end of the line on the right side, the number number of, of applications developed for uh, being used by farmers is quite large in CGIR. So I will take the example of the phenotypic data because this is where we started 10 years ago. There was a, a request from the breeding platform, integrated breeding platform, that is an ambitious program uh, now being used by 500 users for uh, designing breeding program for crops. And when the breeding management system were in place, they realized that uh, there was a lot of confusion between what is a threat, what is a variable, what is an, a naming convention for the variables. And sometimes threats, uh, part of plants were described with different threats while it was the same. Breeders had their own way of describing their threats and variables. And as Marie said, it was not very usable by a secondary use or not very um, uh, fit for meta-analysis. So there was really uh, a need also to understand the definition of the threat and variables and their measurement methods, which are very different if you go to the farmer, the breeders, the agronomists, or the modelers. And as an example, I have the plant 8 in sorghum, and you see the scientist said plant 8 can be, in fact, four different traits because you don't measure probably the plant 8 the same way uh, at the same uh, stage. So you need good definitions and definition of the method. So the crop ontology was born uh, out of that need of harmonizing the way you describe your traits and variables. And uh, it's the idea was the crop ontology would provide a framework for describing measured trait parameters and their standard variables. So it can be directly consumable by breeding field books, electronic field books mainly, and also for the data annotation in the crop databases. And this project was a collaborative project with all the centers ha uh, having a, a mandate crops and deploying a breeding management system. So as Marie said, uh, I have a very short description. When you have received an Excel file from a breeding program, the columns are quite cryptic because they are using uh, abbreviation as the, the breeders are, is used to use, but for a secondary user, it may not make much sense. So first, an annotation might explain what is the observation about. So it's a trait, and a trait is an entity, it's a part of the plant, and an attribute. So you're looking at an attribute of that part of the plant. For example, you can look at the leaf and observe the leaf color, or you can observe a spot uh, from a symptom of a disease. Then you have to be very clear on what is uh, described in the headers of the colon, what has been observed. Then you may describe, you must describe how the threat was observed, because there are many ways. And now with the multiplication of the sensors, drones, high throughput, then you really need to, to let the secondary user how the, the threat was measured. And then you have to explain the scale you use because there are many scales available, particularly categorical scales. So if you don't describe your scale somewhere, uh, it will be very difficult to integrate your data set with data set from another similar uh, exper experiment, for example. Then the project of the crop ontology has been looking at improving the reusability of the data files. And then the principle is that when you prepare a, a, a field book, an electronic field book that will be used uh, across several sites for a given observation, then the best is to combine with the, the threat and variables of the crop ontology. So most of the breeding system we work with nowadays, they are uh, embedding all our traits and variables 
and then the breeder can select which traits and which variable will enter into the experiment he's designing and then the breeder will produce the field book either on excel or either in a field book uh, electronic field book and then this will be distributed to the evaluation sites for enumerators to take the, the measurement. And out of the electronic field book, then you will um, obtain an already well-described Excel file with the, the nomenclature we propose for variables, which is the, the trait, the method, and the scale. So it gives immediately an understanding of what is the value you've been uh, observing or measuring. And this can be uh, uploaded in the breeding management system that are conceived with the, the crop ontology as uh, for describing variables. And out of that database, then you can start uh, making analysis, simple statistical analysis, or if you combine several multi-sites, you start to do meta-analysis. So this is the pipeline we have been working with, with breeders, the, all the traits and variables have been validated by lead centers, centers having a mandate crop, and they have worked closely with their uh, scientists. So each breeder has validated the list. So once it is validated by the, the breeders uh, and their partners, then it's published on our online website. The idea is by being uh, published, then it gives visibility to the product, which is an intellectual asset, in fact, in a way, because you have a lot of work done on selecting traits, defining the traits, how it is used, and what are the, all the ways of measuring that trait. And then uh, it's downloadable, so it's open. So anybody working, for example, on wheat, who is interested to understand what uh, trade dictionary, what ontology CIMIT has produced for wheat, can download it in several formats. So it's reusable as a, as a re semantic resource. They are, so in that resource, you can, of course, open the, the, the display and access directly the, the thread, the method of measurement of that thread. In that case, it's grain number per spike. So it's a computation, and uh, the scale is a grain per spike. So it's quite a, a important work, but once it's done, it's, it's really a useful resource for a large community. So the crop ontology over years has developed an agreement with readers about what are the threat classes we want. Uh, so it's, it makes the access uh, um, easier. So you have abiotic stress threat, agronomical stress, agronomical threat, biochemical threats, etc. So all those classes are consistent acro across all the crops. And we have uh, proposed the classification of the method, so it's easy to describe. So the result of this 10-year project with the, the agri-food system uh, centers and their partners is a, what we can call a good practice. So we are promoting uh, a workflow where um, centers or partners or projects who want to start a, an evaluation program for a given crop will check first what we have online for that crop and if any threat or variable are missing, they will work together and propose their variables and threats with the threat dictionary template. It's a simple Excel file, but they can describe the threats and variable the way we recommend to describe. And we propose a guideline for that. So there is a guidelines being uh, downloadable from our site. And then once it's done, we update our website with the new version of the crop ontology, uh, including new threats and variables, and this can be used uh, with field books and uploaded in databases. So this is what we, we promote, and nowadays we have 27 species online, included recently uh, an algae, which is sugar cane. So as an example of use in a project uh, for sorghum, for example, there is a large project called Yavao, which is for the innovation and improvement of varieties in West Africa. And it's a large network, including ICRISAT, the integrated breeding platform, and several African, French uh, institutions. And the idea is to set up um, multi-environment trials in West Africa and to facilitate 
the data collect and meta analysis to be able to predict some phenotypes according to the environment. Um, the the project has been uh, adopted uh, the field book of the integrated building platform, and they are using through this field book the sorghum ontology that they are uh, they have been developed. Uh, developing with ECRISAT, and they are still improving, sending back some threats and variables. And then from the multi-sites across several countries in West Africa, they collect the data and they upload it in uh, databases um, that have been conceived and integrating the variable uh, structure. So it makes the data flow easier and the meta-analysis easier. The crop ontology is a public good. It's a CC by product. So um, all what we publish is reusable. Uh, we have several ways of using it. I won't give details now. But you see that the fact it's available, it's validated by experts. So it's really based on expert knowledge. Then it makes our resource a stable and reliable resource. And the use is being uh, multiplied. So all those uh, databases are databases working with phenotypic data, trade data for crops, and uh, some are from the root tubers and banana CRP, for example. Others are from private uh, partners, uh, others from European partners. So it's uh, over years, it has spread as a reference for uh, crop breeding traits. An ontology can help linking data across species because the crop ontology has been very crop specific, so species specific. But if you have a, a terminology like, like food color trait from the trait ontology, uh, reference ontology, then it means you could, you could search, uh, if the ontology is very well developed and the mapping of the terms using food color trait. You could retrieve data from banana, maize, uh, rice, uh, etc. Despite the the way you you name uh, the fruit is different because the ontology has encapsulates those terms under a common term called food color trait. So uh, it's uh, usable in a search. And then you can retrieve, uh, for example, uh, it helps genomics, uh, comparative genomics, because you can retrieve a given uh, trait across several species and perhaps look at what are the genes or, uh, determining that color or that expression. So um, we have been working on the trait uh, descri phenotypic description of uh, varieties, but after, of course, uh, there was a, a need for um, describing the field practices because, of course, it's a genotype by environment, but also with management practices. So we are developing an agronomy ontology in uh, collaboration with Meda de Varé, uh, Big Data Module 1 leader. And the idea is this ontology is helping creating a field book. So this project has, is well advanced now. Uh, we are, uh, we have been compiling mainly agricultural operation for now. So all the way you would prepare uh, your land or your crop is uh, compiled into that ontology. And it's now being embedded with the collaboration of SIP into an online uh, field book uh, builder. Let's call it like that. So the idea being that this online tool will help uh, agronomist to design their uh, field book according to the experiment they want to carry on. And the idea is when they start selecting the field practices they would like to to test or observe, they access in their pick list or and in the categories the ontology terms that have been agreed with the community. So we have uh, we were at the data collect level, so improving the data collect, but also the ontology can be used at the uh, data repository level. And I took the example of Ikrizak, who works on Sorghum. Then you have phenotypic evaluation data uploaded on their Dataverse repository. And if you open the metadata, you see they have annotated their uh, traits and variables with the crop ontology directly. So it helps uh, for the machine uh, readable access, as Marie said, the machine readable access to the data sets. And if you open the data file, you will see that ICRISAT has been carefully 
uh, using the the trait uh, the crop ontology for describing the variables and the headers of their columns. So it means that not only you can find the data sets through the metadata, the keywords, but you can also be have a good understanding of what has been captured within the file. And Marie mentioned the ontology lookup service of the European Bioinformatics Institute. So our ontology should help data annotation, but it's not easy to find a term across the different ontologic resources. So uh, ABI has developed an ontology lookup service where you can type your term and access a proposition of terms uh, that could be selected for your uh, data annotation. Here I took the, the same term, days to 50% flowerings for sorghum, and I got uh, an answer. So the, the term in the middle is the term I'm looking for, and it's coming from the crop ontology. And we are working with uh, MEDA through module one to develop a, 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 a data annotation tool for public repositories. We would like to see that being used up front to our uh, public repositories. It's a data annotation tool that helps you finding your ontological uh, term directly, so you can enter your phenotypic variables, and immediately as a, the, the system will propose you a series of terms that can correspond to your variable, and then you can consult the definition and you select the term that really corresponds to your variable. So it goes into the metadata of your file, and your file, uh, of course, along with the CGIR metadata list, is made ready for upload uh, on a repository of your choice. Then, because this effort has been now since 10 years, a long-term effort, and the resource becomes quite valuable to the community, the big data platform decided to invite us to create the ontology community of practice that would upscale our current community of practice and involve other, other science domain. This community of practice is seen as um, a resource for other community of practice of the big data. I don't know how much you are familiar, but you, you see you have livestock, crop underbilling, agronomy and geospatial and socioeconomic data uh, community of practice. Each community discuss their own issues in how to exchange, integrate, uh, make their data fair, and they often come to us to discuss about the semantic annotation and the, the needs and the, the gaps. So we are a community to help others developing the semantics that is useful for their data resources. Then out, so the crop threat ontology is the oldest. Then we went into the development of an agronomy ontology, and I forgot to say that this agronomy ontology is not completely developed from scratch, but is using already existing ontology, so we are just importing their term into it. Then we, we take those two models to develop now an agricultural household survey, and uh, with the collaboration of IFPRI. And we had recently a meeting in Rome about socioeconomic data, and there was a colleague of yours from the York University who mentioned that there are certainly items to introduce into household surveys to make sure that um, the, the small uh, fisheries uh, are captured into the surveys. Good questions are uh, captured in the surveys. So I think your group, could also contribute to the discussion around the development of this ontology, which is a collaboration between the ontology community of practice and the socioeconomic data community of practice led by Gide and Kuzman from CIMIT. Then through the community of practice of big data, we are looking at adding a livestock ontology, a fish ontology, and a water management ontology. So it's worth uh, initiating this year. We have an internal CGIR ontology working group, which is linked to the data management community of practice of CGIR. So you see all the centers are uh, represented in that uh, working group, and Jacqueline has been joining recently the group. And this group is discussing all the semantic needs of our uh, repositories, database, what we need. And we want to develop uh, working groups, thematic working groups. So we already have the socioeconomic working group. We have a plant working group. 
So if your community decide to go for developing their um, control vocabulary and then their ontology, we could have a, a fish working group that could be led by um, World Fish, for example. Uh, we meet every uh, once a month. So I thought that the last uh, slide uh, could help you understanding how to start and discuss if there is a need. So all the ontology uh, for crops had a lead center, and the center, because we recognize the domain expertise to the center, of course, so if you decide to start an ontology for fish, you have to discuss if wall fish could be the lead center for that. Um, then you need to identify someone in your team that will be willing to, to start with it, consult with the scientist, and start developing the ontology, identifying where, where the vocabularies are. So it means it should be an ontology curator and someone who can work closely with the data manager who is really taking care of publishing the data sets on Dataverse, for example. Then you have to choose your objective. So for what do you need to have a harmonization of your concept? Which science domain? Is it for breeding, aquaculture, fisheries, nutrition? So because you need to start by somewhere. I know that you have several databases. Uh, you have fish base, you have reef uh, base, coral base, so several projects. So you really need to discuss as scientists uh, where you have projects, you need to improve the collect of data and need to improve all the data management cycle. And then once you agree, uh, about the scientific uh, domain, you have to check what ontology and uh, what uh, vocabularies are available uh, outside and here in a house. Work with your domain expert to validate concept definition and variables, and then test your your ontology with uh, data sets. And then you can work with us for the conception of the ontology and to submit to our repository. One of the projects, and I congratulate uh, Wellfish for being the winner of the Inspire Project 2018, is your integrated uh, data pipeline for small-scale fisheries. So, PIRAP, this is one project where you need to have such harmonization of the data you, you collect and, and integrate. And you have another one that was presented in Rome called Illuminating Hidden Harvest. Uh, and Apparently, uh, you need to develop rigorous methodology for data collection and synthesis of small scale, scale fisheries data. This was presented to us by Xavier Bazoro. So perhaps also here you need to have um, uh, some ontology behind. And then uh, this project can certainly contribute to the household ontology as well on how to to describe or add question in household surveys about fisheries and small scale fisheries. So thank you for for listen, listening to to me. And um, it was a bit long. I'm sorry. I hope we still have uh, time for questions.